the um, Rich Neal. Uh, Rich Neal is um, the head of the atmospheric uh, modeling and predictability section here at NCA. Um, he is working, uh, he's also the co-chair of the uh, atmospheric modeling uh, working group. Oh, maybe no longer. No. I just no, I used all to. Right. All right, all right, so you, your bio is uh, outdated. Um, and <laughs> he does a lot of um, uh, development uh, with the uh, community of system model. Um, uh, the atmospheric component um, has done a lot of work um, uh, on the MJO, on blocking, um, and on making the atmospheric component better, um, introdu introducing vertical levels, whatever makes uh, gets gets to the skill of CSM2. Rich had his hands in it. Um, and so, Rich, go ahead. I'm looking forward to yeah. your talk. All right. Thanks, Judith. I shall share my screen now. Um... Can you see that? Perfect. It's not yet full screen. Yeah. How about now? Yeah. Very good. good. All right. Well, uh, it's nice to be you with everyone here. I know the ASP Cloakham's fun. I've been involved in the past and it's, it's a lot of hard work. So thank you, Judith and Anish. <laughs> okay. So today I'm going to talk um, predominantly about atmospheric blocking, um, a little bit about teleconnections and some about the systematic biases that causes problems. And so this is work with the help of these three fine people here. Um, and uh, this is my kind of very uh, uh, brief cliff notes of what I will go through. So, you know, in essence, I'm not sure if people are too familiar with uh, aspects of blocking. So I'll take some time to go through and have why, why it's important. So blocking, you know, the easiest thing here is just to define it in terms of uh, uh, meteorology. I and mean, the key things are you know, they're nearly stationary patterns, um, high pressure at the surface effectively. And what they tend to do is redirect the kind of more synoptic, um, typical um, circulation patterns in the Northern Hemisphere to the North and South. And so this is the only time I'll talk about the US just because it's a nice example of different types of blocks. So you've probably heard, you know, you think about, especially recently in the Northwest there, which is probably a Rex block, I haven't looked in detail, but basically these kind of stationary block uh, patterns can be a, of a number of different um, types. So that's just to orient you kind of geographically what um, um, blocks are. And of course, you know, in terms of impact and synoptics, Western Europe is a big uh, region for uh, blocking and the impacts of blocking and just a couple of winter time, uh, you know, um, Examples here, I'm from the UK, so this is kind of the first time um, I've ever seen the whole of the UK covered by uh, snow and Ireland still manages to escape it, the mm -hmm. Emerald Isle. And over Western Europe here during you know, 2009, there's a very extensive um, uh, cooling of the surface, uh, surface temperature, and this was associated with the block. And also in summertime, probably hear more about the impacts of blocks in summertime. So very stationary high pressures over, over these particular regions. Again, you know, 2003 uh, over France, I'll talk about that in the next slide, was very hot for a you know, protracted period, and also in 2006. And so uh, on the right here, thinking about, you know, Western Russia on the right, this is a time series over Moscow through that period, several months here. Um, and this is a metric of uh, blocking, and I'll, I'll come to this later, but it, essentially this metric of blocking, you know, it, it was stationary for 45 days. And this is kind of the ultimate impact was these you know, real severe, up to 12 Kelvin anomalies during that period. So big weather mm. impacts. In terms of further impacts, uh, you know, because blocking, weather, et cetera, and then what are the societal impacts? And this is a really nice example of what you need to get right with blocking to think about getting the right, um, societal impact. So just go through this. So the side lines here are temperature um, in blue. It's like climatological through summer. And then red was this particular period in 2003. So we had this protracted period of, you know, over 30 Celsius. And the key thing to note from this, if we look at like um, mortality in blue is kind of standard uh, climate, climatology of mortality, if such thing exists. And so the key thing was blocking has to exist for several days before you know, the impacts, uh, you know, on, um, you know, health, et cetera, are, are seen to the extreme. So that's the key thing. Blocking, it's not a question of just capturing the blocking, it's capturing it for an extended period. 
And so in terms of the impact of blocking, it relates on this bottom right here to persistence, having a clear sky, it gives you surface heating, high temperatures in summer, and stability, high stability, it gives rise to poor air quality. So just, just a summary of how all these kind of, um, um, kind of conjoin to give the strongest impacts. And you know you can you can choose your uh, you know interesting one here in terms of the you know the knock-on aspects, a lot of impacts on crops, for example. But but wine was good, wine was better during this year. There you go. Um, so globally, when we think about what how to categorize and what synoptically does it look like, it tend blocking tends to occur. It's two thousand six in this case as a more global pattern. So it's not it tends not to just be isolated on the whole. There tends to be, as you can see, you know, easily, you could easily envisage the wave pattern of, you know, warm, cold, warm, cold, um, seasonal temperature anomalies. And if you look at that from the perspective of the circulation on the left here, um, for that particular period in the previous slide, late July, for example, in climatology, even in summer, you get a pretty much, you know, to the south of its winter position, zonal jet that is pretty consistently zonal. But for that particular period, of what we saw, there was a very large excursion both to the north and south. It is this block, you know, gives rise to high pressure, low pressure climatological. Because so it's important to categorize uh, uh, that with respect to um, trying to predict blocking, of course. And blocking itself is really tough because if you think about the opposite phase, baroclinic um, circulations, there are a lot of theories about baroclinic wave growth, how fronts grow with agiostrophic theory, for example. Um, and it's, it, you, you can, uh, we, we tend to, and most modeling centers do, are able to run simplified models that see how well they reproduce baroclinic activity. And they do on all very well. But there's no such test for blocking. There's no, there's no kind of canonical um, way to think about blocking per se. You know, the, every event is kind of different. And a lot of these events associated on the right here this is a pattern of vorticity, relative vorticity. Yeah. And so basically in the in the in the grays here, it's you know, high pressure associated with anticyclonic circulation. Mm -hmm. And what tends to happen um, is that um, you know there's folding um, of the um, interface between the high and low vorticity, and these tend to be wave breaking events. So it's just either cyclonic in this case, I think, yeah, cyclonic. Uh, no, anticyclonic, and then cyclonic wave breaking. And so that, that's the kind of key thing about whether, uh, you know, you locally you have a jet or whether the wave breaking at the exit of the jet gives rise to these blocking type events, but they're tough to predict. Um, I mean, phenomenologically, what do they look like? How can you categorize this? It is tricky and people use many methods to categorize this. This is kind of four ways some simple, some more complex ways to categorize this. So this is a, an event in 1994, and this is from era interim analysis. And so what we see here is, you know, in the top left, simply surface pressure for this period, obviously high pressure, clear, that's a way to categorize this. Also, what we will look at in terms of, this is the most standard um, metric is the 500 millibar height. And it will turn out that a good metric is the result, the radial gradient of that quantity. Also, um, so on potential vorticity is conserved on theta surfaces. So this, this kind of categorized, uh, you know, the column uh, PV, which includes obviously includes stability and vorticity, and that's conserved. So that's pulled off uh, from the higher PV regions into the lower, you know, essentially climatologically lower regions and that categorizes it as well. And also, you know, there's a reversal of the wind. So there's easterlies, and that's typical in Western Europe. Easterlies, cold in winter, tends to be warmer in winter off the hot continent. So that's just to give you a sense of, um, um, you know, the categorization. And if, you know, I'm not sure whether you can see this over Zoom, but you can see it over that, you know, for the period of 10 days as this particular block is, is uh, uh, evolves. Um, at the end of the, if we look at the bottom right here, the jet is extended there, and then we can see that it's cut off with those easterlies. Well. So these easterlies come in and uh, uh, cut off the jet. So that's just to give you a sense of um, blocking. Okay, just a summary of blocking there. Um, in terms of prediction, in terms of S2S prediction, it's very hard to predict blocking. And it's only in the last few years that there's some progress that has been made. 
but it's also a hard and a standard, you know, up to 10 day forecast. And so this is a really nice example, it's a little old now. Um, but on the left here, for, you can see the position of the 500 millibar height in here, 33 members. So 33 members where this 500 millibar height is this particular value, I can't remember the exact value. They all agree in the Atlantic here you know, because it's baroclinic. So there's a strong jet, baroclinic wave growth region, and they tend to agree in these, this particular region. But when it comes to what happened was there was a block in Eastern Europe here, and we can see that there is disagreement. So some, some of the ensemble members keep this, uh, you know, jet, this um, 500 millibar height level to the south, but a lot of it keep it to the north, which is then that becomes a, you know, disagreement, bifurcation, if you like, of a block versus baroclinic continues. And you can view that in my simple minded thing is that, you know, baroclinic sits across this kind of left detractor here and you're always in it essentially. But if you initialize a forecast close to this, you know, um, connection point. Between it's 10 o'clock. Sorry about that. <laughs> between two uh, attractors, then, you know, problems happen. So a, you can get bifurcation. And another way to see that is just the lead time forecast here. Um, this is a period here. This is in London, I believe. Yeah. So a prediction of London, 10 day forecast, 30 rounds on members, deterministic and analysis. And yeah, at least a day six, they're all in good agreement. This is surface temperature. So in those kind of uh, scenarios, uh, um, regimes they're predicted. But of course, in blocks, it's similar to this kind of scenario here. By day two, there's a lot of there's a lot of disagreement among among the members. Um, and even you know the deterministic one, the high the high resolution one, is in, you know is of order six Kelvin wrong, along with many of the ensembles. Um, uh, by day two and a half, three. So this is a key example where you really need to understand the spread and, 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 and span that spread with a number of ensemble members. But basically, you know, we're thinking about S2S prediction of blocking, but like we're at day three here, so that you can see the challenge. <laughs> so in terms of modeling, again, back to measuring, uh, not just modeling, but categorizations of blocking. Here we have, um, I'll talk a couple of measures of blocking, a one dimensional one, a simpler one, and a more kind of uh, uh, detailed two-dimensional blocking. But as I mentioned on that, on those four um, kind of ways to categorize blocking, this is a 500 millibar height gradient essentially in, um, in the zonal region. And it, there are two um, measures, there are two metrics of measures of blocking, and there is a criteria that um, the difference between these two measures has to exceed a certain value, which would then uh, essentially categorize this folding of the Z500, which looks like a block. So once you, once you exceed that, then you can add that to your proportion of blocking for that period. I'll come to the two dimension ones next. So if you do that, um, what you get is a you know, one dimensional line plot here. So we're looking at, I'll just remind myself around, um, I forget that, yeah, 50 North, uh, essentially 50 North is the center point with this. So what you get is a distribution of blocking frequency. And, the black lines here, a couple of reanalyses, and so let's focus on those first. And we can see that for this, you know, this period 79 to 2005, two very obvious peaks, Western Europe, as we talked about, but also um, the Northern Pacific, Central and Northern Pacific. And, and these are around 20 odd percent of the time. So according to this metric, you know, we're at 20, 20 percent of the time is blocked, and presumably the other 80 percent is more baroclinic. So that's a lot in these peak regions. And then there are minima essentially over, you know, there is a minimum really near the US and then uh, central Russia. But that's not to say the root blocking does not exist. It, it, it's just by this metric is a minimum. This is winter time, sorry, if I haven't mentioned. And the key thing to take away, two, two or three things is, these are CMIP models, the last um, assessment five. And so there is a ton of variability. Climate models do not do a very good job of capturing the frequency of blocking by this metric. The second thing is, you know, the, the key region of Western Europe, where I showed all these examples, all the models, you know, some are close, but all the models do not, none of the models capture the correct frequency of blocking. And, that, and that's a theme of what I show uh, next. A couple of models here, here go close and they're actually a lot, they're a high resolution, sorry, here, they're high resolution GFDL models, but of course the consequence, not of course, but consequences it overestimates into the continent. So. Um, let's just to emphasize that high resolution does not necessarily help you here. Um, 
because as Judith said, my interest is CSM and CAM. And so uh, if we look at um, you know, three versions of CAM mapped across to the, uh, the block the blocking indices, the same as what we showed before, we can see that um, in winter time, we have this problem. No matter the version, I'm not quite sure of CSM2, I do have that plot, but CSM1 has some improvements in DGF, but we really struggle to capture this particular uh, um, you know, Western Europe one. This is secondary Greenland plot uh, maximum. We also fail to capture that. You know, but in the Pacific, we're doing a pretty good job. The variability is higher in the Pacific, and that's probably related over this time period to ENSO. But in general, um, the client model does a good job, but just to emphasize, all models do not do a good job in Western Europe, which is a problem when you think you're using them, particularly in S2S type frameworks, using climate models with initialized uh, uh, states. From analyses, it, it's hard to capture that. You know, you can look at other seasons where blocking is less, slightly less important. March, April, May, we do a good job. The jet is weaker, so it may, as I'll show in a second, may relate to the strength of the jet uh, that is really making it hard for us to reproduce. And we've made some improvements. Too. And also in summertime here, much weaker frequencies, um, but um, still, still well captured. So that's just kind of an aside of how we do. And as I mentioned, I mentioned the jet. Um, we can see here um, now. I've uh, split it up uh, in terms of uh, the blocking strength for a particular um, longitude. So I'm doing this analysis along all these longitudes for and then for a climatological year. So every time it's orange or hatched, then that's a blocking, and every time um, it looks kind of blue, then that's more blocking. So you can kind of pick out the improvements that I talked about. CAM3 uh, was really poor for most of the, most of the time um, in Western Europe here. And we've clearly made some um, uh, improvements through to CAM5. So, I mean, you, and you can see this blocking is not stationary. Sometimes it retrogrades with time and sometimes it um, um, you know, moves further to the West. So there's a lot of um, um, characteristics of the blocking that is really hard to capture. And just coming back to the strength of the jet, maybe responsible for some of these biases. And this is the eddy kinetic energy of the jet in winter time. This is in CAM5, which does, I don't show it next to observations, but it does a very good job. And if I look at CAM3, then the strength of this jet really is way too strong. Um, the you know, energetics of the jet well into Western Europe. And this might explain why this Rosby wave breaking um, just, just cannot, um, is either too far east or more likely, it just it just cannot break down the jet uh, through blocking processes. Okay, what's next? So you know, to now to combine, you know, the the model using it in now we're using it in prediction mode. So these caps, which is similar to S two S type uh, um, simulations, and again we're predicting just to I'm not put much information here, but 2008 2009, so the winter of that, it's part of this uh, year of the tropical convection period. We this is. Um, CAM5, um, so it's not the most recent version of the model, but some S2S has been done with this, I think. And so we're looking through a season where there's been some blocking based on that metric. Um, and, you know, the solid line, dotted line uh, is day zero, so the analyses essentially. And sorry, just the dotted line. And we can see the evolution over you know, just five days. So we're not really <laughs> into the S2S period. And so we can see that, you know, the biases of the model come out pretty darn quickly. Um, where we where we said it was a problem, so DGF um, it reduces its magnitude in the um, you know in the Western Pacific, uh, Western uh, Western uh, Europe, and then it increases the magnitude further to the west. So although it's not necessarily decreasing everywhere in that region, we can see that that is the source of the greatest biases up to day five. So and that it seems to be continuing to get worse beyond day five. This is seen a little bit in summer where we do see a reduction of that, but it's just stark to see that the biases of the model in climate mode really are the places for blocking where they really come out in these shorter term forecasts. So again, bottom line is the biases in the model really are really gonna matter because they matter even after five days. So you can imagine after 20, 30 days for, for sub-seasonal. So jump now to the to the two-dimensional metric. So this is essentially a, kind of a repeat um, of what is done here, 
but now we're we're doing it essentially in two dimensions, not just uh, um, doing this metric. You can do it a number of thresholds, of course. I mean, you can you can vary this, but this is the way we did it in this particular paper. And so, um, <coughs> excuse me. And so this is a two D metric. So you're going to see some geographic plots of blocking. So this is um, uh, blocking with with respect to uh, uh, winter time here, and so there's a little bit more detail now. So it's essentially, although the blocking West Pacific was seen just as strong in some sense in this region compared to the Atlantic, and uh, sorry Pacific, it's a little bit stronger, but at a higher latitude. And now we can see the you know the Greenland blocking much more obviously. So the you know these are the focus reasons we've done we we you know, reason we've been focusing on in previous uh, research to to try and understand the uh, uh, the biases here and. Just for interest, there is blocking that occurs in the southern hemisphere uh, that um, you know Australian researchers are, are interested because it relates to you know southern the southern impact of El Nino, for example. Um, how well do we do? Again, just a quick plot of uh, things that have improved. And again, DGF, no, no surprise, based on even on the one D metric blocking. You know, Western Pacific really is the killer region for. Um, you know, uh, sorry, Western, my region's mixed up. Western Europe is really the challenging region for blocking, which is unfortunate, as I say, because that is where, you know, we think about blocking and the NAO, North Atlantic Oscillation, trying to predict that. This is going to be a, a tough model to do that. Seems like there is some improvement in the very North Pacific, which I'm not really worked at. But March, April, May, as we saw, has a dramatic improvement. So, um, but again, the dynamics are slightly different than much of them. What I'm going to show briefly now is regional patterns of what does blocking result in in terms of um, uh, the meteorological response, temperature, uh, precipitation. And the way I'm going to do that is uh, the, for this blocking metric, I'm going to construct a kind of composite picture where we're looking at the strongest you know, to the right of this um, dotted line and the weakest to the left, 10th percentile. Just CSM one in this case, not these other models, and comparing that in Europe and Pacific two um, analyses. So this is what you get if you take the strongest ten percent and weakest ten percent in the Atlantic and Pacific. This is the geopotential height field that you get um, for for observation. So it's pretty large scale. There is associated obviously for Atlantic low, there's an Atlantic high. And similarly uh, for the Atlantic high, West Pacific high, there's a, a, a low anomaly to the to the south and similar to the Pacific. So the question is, can we capture the response um, at these two, um, uh, in these two regions? And so this is now a good example, summertime, um, West Pacific here, we look at this composite as I showed on the left, what's the response that we get in summer? And so it's warmer in summer as we expect over Europe, slightly colder over the Mediterranean and precipitation much drier uh, um, in the model, and then uh, much wetter over the Mediterranean. So these are, if you can get the blocking, these are the kind of meteorological patterns you really want to catch, obviously, for you know, extremes and um, uh, impacts. Uh, and this compares pretty favorably to era interim, kind of surprising some of those. So it's a kind of a nice example that, you know, regionally this this is well captured. In winter time, not so much, which is um, um, surprising from the perspective that it's actually the signal is actually stronger um, for uh, the, the tail of the um, model uh, that's greater than 90% percentile. Temperature um, distribution is pretty good, you know, uh, regionally in London, all the way over to uh, Western Europe, and it really does capture this upstream. But the precipitation is not as good. The Western Europe signal is way too strong. Another example of, you know, a, a poor kind of composite uh, picture of this. Uh, you know, strongest blocking and weakest blocking. It's just the blocking. Um, a good temperature signal for blocking events over the uh, Northern Pacific, but over in terms of precipitation, the model, and I don't understand quite why, but the model seems to think that blocking is associated with a ton of precipitation signal over the Western Pacific. And again, that's troublesome because if you do capture, for example, you know, the Pacific North American PNA pattern pretty well, then you're kind of in trouble because you your precipitation signal on the west coast of the US might be erroneous. So there's something to watch out for. All right. So I finally got to teleconnection. Sorry for taking me a while. So 
where does this all sit in terms of, you know, what Jaime talked about, NGO and the connections through the Northern Hemisphere? That, um, and can we predict blocking? Can we predict the teleconnection pathways? And so, yeah, as I've said before, the for, you know the institute short-term forecast finds it very hard. So the question is, can we do anything from the perspective of um, uh, blocking on these uh, time scales? So this is a kind of a nice graphic of you know MGO type um, circulation convection in the um, Pacific, uh, Indian Ocean, how that moves uh, <clears throat> into the Central Pacific. Um, the upper level diver, you know, these are the this is the train of you know canonical ways that I'm sure you've been told about already during the uh, colloquium. So essentially, you know, convection heating up a troposphere divergence through a process through a um, mechanism called Ros Rosby wave source generation impacts the circulation in the North Pacific uh, that can set up a uh, low wave number of Rosby waves and these kind of shaded blue, orange, blue are kind of PNA type pattern. Um, and then there is some. I'm never quite sure what these dotted lines are impact into the North Atlantic. So, and this is describing the, in the North Atlantic, the North Atlantic oscillation of which blocking is a component of that. So I'll, I'll go into that in a second. But the key thing, you know, the Ross wave source is used on uh, um, seasonal time scales and, uh, and I'll show you an example in a second, it's used on you know, sub-seasonal time scales. So Ross wave source essentially says, what is the impact of the divergent circulation and the mean, the, both the anomalous and mean component of that and uh, uh, you know, the rotational circulation. And there are a number of terms that basically say, this is the source of the Rosby wave activity, you know, involves sort of, you know, divergent, mean divergent, anomalous, di mean vorticity times an anomalous divergence, advection of mean vorticity gradient by anomalous divergent. When this is a more understandable because this, the divergence from the convection you know, really uh, impinges along the uh, mean gradient of the vorticity on the jet. Essentially. So these, particularly these two terms are the most important. But so this is a really nice study that I came across. And basically it's showing uh, an example of, can you connect the MGO, acti MGO activity to North Atlantic oscillation and presumably blocking? So this is, um, what happens here is, there uh, is a simulation of around 180 days, so six months from October 1st, and simulation using CAM. But what you do instead of letting 50 of these simulations run and see if you capture the MGO, you impose the heating in all of these simulations. So you impose the MGO heating. So this red and blue essentially is the vertic vertically integrated heating. And that's imposed from a, I'm not quite sure exactly the year, but a particular year. And so this is a succession of events that relates to this. Um, schematic to the right. And so these events propagate the black lines here. So uh, are the Rosby wave source. So as soon as it gets to around 120 East, that impinges on the jet and, and the divergent flow has an impact on the circulation. It's generating Rosby waves. Further to the wet, for, to the East, the, the, these uh, cyan type lines are the, uh, energy, uh, the jet um, kinetic energy. So then, not only are you forcing a PNA type pattern, but you're impacting the jet's kinetic energy. And ultimately, you know, it's it's the connection between this and this that is that is a hard to understand and b hard to uh, determine based on the fact that there's a you know the NAO is quite noisy and you need fifty simulations to get any kind of signal. But ostensibly, you know, you can say you know once you generate the reservoir source at around 120 east and it impact the jet. Then later, it's slightly more baroclinic when you look at these 50 uh, uh, simulations. And also during the kind of quiescent phase, uh, oh, sorry, got that the wrong way around. During the active phase, then, you know, the blocking baroclinic is about even, but that's just saying the blocking is more than climatological. So that's just, these signals are very small. There's a lot of noise. And again, this is related, this is based on perfect uh, heating from the MGO. So, but of course we know, as I mean, said, there's a long way to go between initialized simulation and near perfect heating. You know, finally, there's a, you know, there's a- Sorry, Rich, sorry. can you uh, wrap up in two minutes or so? Yeah, yeah, I think I've just, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah, two slides. There's a further complication is that, again, that's um, uh, is based on a series of success, succession of events to, you know, have to occur in terms of get this teleconnection. 
So this is an example we've been working on. When we look at the fives and the sixes are uh, AMIG-5, AMIG-6 type simulation. So they all have the same SSTs. And this is, uh, on the left here is the divergence anomaly related to the Rosby wave source. So um, clearly, you know, the analyses lie here at a 1.5 um, um, uh, times 10 to minus six uh, divergence. And that gives you a Rosby wave source you know, on top. And some model occupy this, same phase space, you know, CAM6, uh, sorry, uh, AMIG6 and AMIG5. And so we can see here, um, but there is a, there's a good relationship between Raspberry wave source and divergence, but of course the divergence is not great. And, um, you know, I'll, I'll flip down to this right one here and say climatological divergence here is poor in, in, in CMIG6, in a, um, um, sorry, in CSM2. Uh, so a number of these models are quite poor. And then, but they have a relationship that's pretty well defined. But then you say, what is the relationship between Rosby wave sources here, all, all four of them that I showed, and the PNA index. So that's the forcing of the PNA index from the divergent flow. And so, yeah, it's all over the place. There's a lot of work to be done. There are some, um, you know, the lie where the analyses, but the forcing of the PNA, you know, which is critical uh, in terms of thinking about the jet activity and then, you know, impacting, uh, uh, blocking downstream and also in the North, the North Pacific maximum. It really is, hot. it really is, um, there's not much skill at all in these models. And this is my last slide. And it's, it's, you know, it's the only tropical slide I've shown, but I, I think it relates to some of the questions before actually. Again, you know, that, though, that, simul that study of those 50 ensemble nervous that gave rise to, you know, some small signal in the uh, um, blocking versus non-blocking. You know, they're, they're predicated on, you know, getting uh, good tropical heating as well. And this is just, I think, a nice example that shows, again, this is CAM5 used in a, a, these initialized simulations for a period shown on the right here that has a number of uh, MGOs during the period. And we can see that what, what are the biases at different periods in, this, in the kind of lead time? So day one, day two, day two, 10, or for all the, uh, for all the um, forecasts through this period. You know, and it's it's complicated, and, and like as we talked about, there's a certain you know day one. There's a there's this dry shock, if you like, the convection. Um, have I gone the wrong way? Yeah, dry shock. The convection does not respond to the analyses, which is you know obviously what we haven't talked about is this is not uh, none of the STS are native native analyses. They're all analyses that come from either you know Mary uh, era. So there is some initial shock, you know, in terms of thinking about it doesn't like the analyses, but then it recovers. By day two, and overdoes it, it would seem. Uh, but then by day ten, this is now where the uh, model biases are, are coming in. So I mean, it has to be stressed, and I'm sure it's been stressed. Model biases, even before day ten, are really, really a problem. If you, if I looked at the model bias field of these anomalies, it looked very similar. So yeah, I'll just leave this, and um, yep, yeah, it's what I've, and, and uh, you know, the last two lines essentially are the key thing in terms of. You know, progress in terms of prediction relates to a number of successive events, successive connections along, along the teleconnection pathway, which is not, you know, which is not new, but I think tropical vector and divergence jet interactions, they're all part of the, the, the barrier in terms of um, getting good uh, blocking prediction on these time scales. I'm losing my voice, so thanks. Thank you very much, Rich. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for introducing us to blocking and, uh, and I wasn't sure if it was been talked about, so I. I no, thought. it was great. No, we we it came up, but it wasn't.